Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. A welcome to our event with the Economic Club of Minnesota. We're pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University, which I'm pleased to lead. And we have a society of presidential pollsters there that are pollsters that advise presidents in the White House. Uh, Mark Penn was nice enough to help endow that society. And we're pleased to have two pollsters with us here to share with you what public opinion looks like, how does it impact presidential decisions. We have with us uh, Mark Penn, who is Bill Clinton's pollster. He is Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Microsoft. Uh, he has advised uh, not just three, uh, the last three CEOs at Microsoft, but has been pollster for Hillary Clinton, as well as uh, our good friend from, from UK, Tony, Tony, Blair. <laughs> Tony Blair, as well as wrote the uh, book Microchance. Please welcome Mark Penn. And to balance things out, we have Jan Lobenhausen, who was George Bush's uh, pollster. He also was a pollster to Mitt Romney, Mitch McConnell, several corporations, associations, and think tanks. Uh, please welcome Jan to us, our stage as well. Just have a seat. And, you know, the only poll that matters, they say, we just had, the election day. And it had a pretty dramatic result but there's still a lot of debate as to what it all means. You know, was this a big shift? Was this a, a support of a Republican agenda? Or was it a rejection or a complaint about the Obama tenure to date? There's many decisions to be made. What will this mean for the future? What will it mean about whether things get done in Washington? Those are some of the things we're going to explore today. I'm going to begin by asking our panelists a few questions but then we're going to be turning it over to the audience to get your questions as well. So please get those ready. Let me start out by talking about midterm. Uh, midterms are an election that are typically uh, the higher propensity turnout voters, oftentimes more older, more whiter than you would have in a presidential race that has historically tend to favor Republicans. Uh, presidential years are much more difficult, much more challenging. Let's begin with you, Mark. How was this midterm similar to or different from previous midterms that we've experienced? Well, <clears throat> I think this, this midterm was a replay of a lot of midterms in which there's typically a wave in one direction and it plays itself out. Uh, and midterms, if you look at, at 2000, if you look at 2010, uh, I'm even used to, I always joke, the midterms of the 1994 midterms were the midterms that got me my job with President Clinton, uh, because after those midterms, President Clinton looked at the results and said, how am I possibly going to win you know, my next presidency in 1996? Uh, I think these were pretty tough midterms. You know, the president's at around 40% uh, in terms of approval, uh, close to two-thirds of the country is dissatisfied with the direction of the country. Uh, the turnout was small, so I think there's a pretty good argument that, that, uh, that actually with the kind of turnout that you saw in the presidential race, the results would have been different. Uh, but there was much higher turnout in the, in the very competitive states. So if you, if you look at it, it was the lowest turnout on record for quite some time in the high 30s of, of eligible voters. Uh, there was a substantial shift from younger voters to older voters uh, at the polls. Uh, I think all of these things, you know, make a tremendous difference. But you saw in Colorado and, Ohio and Iowa and other states like that, turnout was in the 50s. And if you go to New York, turnout was in the 20s. So there was a huge differential. Voters today are pretty well educated, and they tend to say, you know what, nothing's happening this year. Well, you know what, it's extremely important to me, there's a highly contested race, uh, I'm going to turn out. But, but the bottom line, was there a message sent? Yes, the message, it's the same message as in 2010. We're not happy 
we want to see some changes in the direction of the country, uh, and, and that's our message. I don't think it was a Republican mandate, because I don't think the Republicans had a clear message going into the race outside of the fact that they thought Obama wasn't doing a good job. They didn't have a coalescing candidate, a message, a contract with America, anything that you could really point to. And then when you look at the exit polls, I think you see the manifestation of the general discontent in the country coming out on the, as you say, the poll that counts. Jan, any different views or advice as to what this might mean for 2016? Well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple points. The, the, the people who do show up are the people who are angry. And um, it's usually anger at the in party. Um, so in 82 and 86, and um, again in 2006, um, Democrats were angry. And um, Republicans uh, were conflicted and stayed home. And you had exactly the opposite in 94, and now again in 06, and, and in, uh, I'm sorry, in 10 and in 14. Um, Republicans are angry, they're angry at the incumbent in the White House, and Democrats are cross-pressured and they stayed home. And the, uh, the largest margins for Republicans were in the lowest turnout states. In the states where you had high turnout, the margins weren't so great. Scott Walker, uh, Wisconsin high turnout state, just barely won. Um, I, I, won't ha I won't go over what happened here in, Min in, in Minnesota. Um, Colorado is an interesting case. Uh, turnout was quite high because it was the first all vote by mail election, and it was a, a, a quite a close election. It was not that huge landslide that you saw in other states. Um, so, what does this mean for the future? Well, there's this debate going on over um, whether or not uh, the Democrats have a lock on younger voters, and younger voters show up more in um, in in presidential elections, um, as do minority voters, and therefore. The table for 2016 is already set, um, and um, yes, Republicans can win midterms because they have older white voters, but Democrats, they cannot win um, presidential elections. There, there are reasons why uh, Republicans have a harder time winning presidential elections, um, but they don't have to do with that. Um, there was quite a bit of swing. It's not just that younger voters showed up less. They also voted less Democratic and more Republicans than they did in previous elections, and there is some evidence that some minority voters in some states voted a little bit more Republican. So Kasich in Ohio got 25% of, of the African-American vote. Um, Abbott and Cornyn in Texas got well into the 40s uh, of the Hispanic vote. So it's a combination of, of turnout and swing. Um, does that mean that um, um, we now, we Republicans now have an e e even shot at winning in, in 2016? No, not at all. And the big problem is that the largest states um, go Democratic. So between California with, what, 58 electoral votes and New York with how many, almost 30, um, the Democrats start with um, close to 90 electoral college votes. Uh, the only big state that uh, Republicans can really count on is Texas with, I think, 36 electoral votes. Um, so uh, b before we've even started, we're already spotting them 60 electoral votes, you need slightly over 200 to win. So the Democrats do have a built-in advantage um, in presidential elections, and they will uh, for a number of reasons coming up. But it, it's not related to this election, and it's not related to, to turnout. <clears throat> now, we are coming up on another open enrollment for the Affordable Care Act, uh, sometimes referred to as Obamacare. Uh, that was a big issue a year ago. How big of an impact did it have in this election? And what kind of an impact do you foresee it having coming up in the next election? Well, if you look at the polls, 27% said that <coughs> they were voting to send a message about a, Obamacare. So that was neither a, a zero number nor an overwhelming number. I think it tended to recede somewhat from the uh, front burner of the campaign as national and international events tended to overtake things. And also, as more and more people are enrolled in the program, and as the program becomes, I think, you know, entrenched as a part of American life, the people now have coverage that they can turn to. They're getting used to the coverage. Will this coverage be more or less expensive? How will business adapt to it? I think people are kind of more on a journey about, about Obamacare than there were, I think, uh, maybe about a year ago, when particularly when the, when the, site, the site was not working, 
where they were out and out rejecting it and very upset about it. So I think that they've now moved to a little bit more of a wait and see. I think we saw a lot of the Republican rhetoric go from I'm going to repeal it to I'm going to amend it rather than, rather than end it. Uh, you know, kind of language, and I think I think that's where the where the debate I think has moved on that. Jan, different view, or no? no I, I I agree with that. Um, th th we started advertising on Obamacare last year. I mean, there were uh, Obamacare is bad, and my opponent supports it ads running in October, November of last year, and um, they just wore themselves out. There is this thing in in campaigning that is called message renewal. If you beat the stuffing out of a single issue, um, after some time people are going to say, yeah, I, I heard you. Okay, now let's move on to something else. And I think Republicans started to realize that by summer and started uh, switching to other issues to campaign on. And so the, it's not that the issue got dropped, but it certainly didn't, wasn't the sole issue driving the election uh, by any stretch. The second thing that happened was that uh, Republicans uh, started reading uh, polls and they saw that while people didn't like Obamacare, they didn't want to repeal it, they wanted to amend it um, by rather substantial margins. So there was this oops moment where a candidate said, uh, well, geez, uh, that means I have to be for something. Um, and being for something is risky. Um, that just exposes you. And if you're not uh, a Puritan repeal all the way uh, to satisfy the Tea Party types, you could get in trouble. Um, they might not show up. Um, so I think it, it, once they started thinking about it a little bit, it became more difficult. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to, hap to see what happens there in the next uh, six to nine months. Um, but there, the repeal is, is simply not an option, and Senator McConnell said it the other day. Um, he pointed out that the, the president would have to sign it. That's not going to happen. Um, what he didn't point out is, is that at best he's going to have 54 votes in the Senate. And if you could see how much he could obstruct with 41 votes, surely a repeal is not going to get through the Senate if the Democrats decide to filibuster it. Now, whether they want to do that or not, I don't know. But um, So repeal is simply not an option. Um, right now, the enrollment is headed for around 9.5, 10 million. Um, whether those folks are happy with it or not um, is kind of hard to say. Um, I worked on uh, the introduction of Medicare Part D. Uh, it was deeply problematic politically um, when it was adopted, but a year after it passed, the, the public opinion on it transformed and it went from a political issue to a consumer issue, and the people that had Medicare Part D that were covered by it, uh, the seniors were very happy with it. And I think there is a distinct possibility that that may take place. It depends on their consumer experience between now and 2016. So let's assume the scenario that we have a House uh, Senate with 60 votes, so no filibuster, and a, and a Republican in the White House, it's not going to happen, but let's just assume it. Are we really going to make 10 million people who have coverage on the, which may be a larger number by then, maybe up to 15 by then, and, and take away uh, their, um, their medical care and, and throw them back to the uninsured or back into the um, whatever other programs they had before they went to, through these exchanges? I don't, I don't think so. So realistically, what we're talking about is fixing it not, uh, not um, 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 repealing it. Um, so I think uh, th that that's absolutely right. The politics weren't there before the elections. The politics are not there after the elections. The politics aren't going to be there in 2016. Um, so we're somehow going to have to figure out a way to survive Obamacare and, uh, and, and, and find a way uh, to make it a, uh, maybe slightly less uh, restrictive and slightly cheaper uh, program. Now, you both advised presidents in the White House. Uh, pretend that you're advising President Obama. Yeah. Uh, he has uh, one achievement uh, from his perspective, which we've just spoken about, but he might be thinking about a legacy beyond that. And if you think about uh, what happens in the last two years of a presidency, he's got maybe <clears throat> nine months at most before we'd talk about nothing else other than 2016. Let me start with you, Jan, first. What advice would you have to uh, President Obama? What does the polling say about immigration, about tax reform, about trade? You know, what could he realistically grab onto and try to make a big push in these last few months of open uh, opportunity to uh, create a legacy? Well, he has a number of options. Um, one of them is to, to to do exactly what you're suggesting, which is to work with McConnell and Boehner 
on passing substantive legislation, and, and that would be on the list. Um, um, trade would be on the list. Uh, corporate tax reform would be on the list. Um, immigration reform might be on the list. I have my doubts about that one. And there are other areas. There's energy. Um, there's banking reform. Um, the, uh, Frank Dodd needs to be amended as much as uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act needs to be amended. So th there are possibilities of cooperating, but they involve compromise, and there are, some of them are d politically fairly difficult. Um, is, is, that an, is that a way to build a legacy? They're necessary uh, items, but 10 years from now, is he going to remember, be remembered for amending Frank Dodd? or passing immigration reform. Who, who knows the last immigration, name of the last immigration reform bill? You voted for it, so you can't answer it. Does anybody remember? <laughs> does, does anybody remember? It's not many, right? Simpson, Mazzoli? I mean, that's not really legacy building. Um, the second thing he can do is, is um, he can go to foreign policy, and I think there are opportunities there. A foreign policy is kind of, the, you're like, you, you can't work with Washington, so I'm gonna do foreign policy. Um, Bush kind of tried that. That didn't really work. Um, but I think there are opportunities there. I think his whole pivot to Asia is absolutely correct. Um, it's very important, and it could be his legacy. It could be his, the Obama doctrine. Um, and I, so I think there are opportunities there, and he has far more uh, room to move there. And I think the odds of being remembered 10 years from now for the pivot to Asia and the Obama doctrine than for amending um, simpson Mazzoli. Um, the third thing he could do is just what he really likes to do, which is to be right. I mean, he would rather be right than pass something. Um, and he can, be, um, he can be remembered as the, 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 the theorist and the, the purist of, uh, of the liberal left. I don't think there's a legacy there either. So I think we're already here and that Obamacare is the legacy. Mm -hmm. It's got his name on it. Um, we're not, we're not going to get rid of it. Um, so I think he's basically already, it's set. It's, we're done. Are we done, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I always used to joke uh, between the difference between the way the Democrats and the Republicans would see the presidency, which is that President Clinton saw each day in the presidency that it was a good day if he did something. Uh, that day as president that he thought would benefit the American people. And, and a view was the Republicans always thought it was a good day if the president did nothing. That meant that the government didn't do anything. And that was conservative versus, <laughs> conservative versus, <laughs> conservative versus activist view <laughs> of the presidency. And uh, you can have, have your own view on that, but if you're, if you're an activist and, and you've got two years left, uh, I think that, that they're, they're looking, number one, <clears throat> at, you know, what is the most important things that you can or should do for the country, not just in terms of the trees, but in terms of the forest, right? And so what is that forest? America seems to have been stuck. It didn't really get to the, to, to, uh, to really to have an economic, uh, full economic revival. Uh, wages haven't been moved. Uh, the healthcare system's in transition. The immigration system is stuck. The budget negotiations have, have broken down. There are big global issues like climate change and ISIS. I think the president's first going to kind of look at what are the limits of executive authority. And you're seeing him push the limits of executive authority as it relates to climate change. You're seeing uh, yesterday, I think he, he gave a, a statement uh, r related to the <clears throat> net neutrality, which he doesn't directly decide, but which three Democratic or plus two Republican commissioners of the FCC will decide. Uh, I think that he's going to continue to look for how he can make a mark using executive authority. The process of negotiation, negotiating with the Republicans to resolve issues is as yet unproven. And so in his mind, there's going to be a choice between making a big executive order on immigration come the State of the Union or holding out first and trying to negotiate reforms and immigration reforms through the process with the new Republican leadership. I think that will be the biggest decision that you'll see made over, over the next couple of months, and it will have a big impact. Uh, Latino turnout in the midterms was depressed compared to the presidential. Uh, I think clearly the Latino community is waiting to see the president 
make one step or the other uh, on this big issue. And, and then I do think you, you see on the foreign policy side, there's Asia, there's always the dream of trying to do something in the Mideast. Uh, <clears throat> there's the deteriorating relationship uh, with Russia. There's what can be in the Ukraine. There's plenty of areas both of frustration and areas of, of opportunity to try to make a mark as president. President Clinton tried to keep open uh, peace negotiations in the Mideast almost up until the very last day of his presidency. So he fought uh, every day to try to do something. And uh, we'll see. I think that the opportunity is still there in two years uh, to, make, to, to make a mark. And, and finally, you know, turning the economy around. Tremendous progress has been made in the economy. And how, how far will that progress go uh, in the next two years will be important for where the next presidency goes and for what the president, for what the country thinks of this presidency. I want to change the lens a little bit. You, you're advising the president, but you also need to understand the mind of the Congress. If the Republican Congress chose to work with the president and get something done on any of these issues we talked about, tax reform, trade, immigration, would the Republicans be uh, get a benefit out of that with public opinion, get a negative out of that from public opinion? What realistic reward or punishment would <coughs> await them if they actually did reach out and work with the president in the next nine months? Well, the, 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 the classic theory on this, which was, goes back to you know, the period in, in uh, really in the 90s in which President Clinton negotiated with the Republican leadership, the, the, the classic theory on this is that those who negotiate and let's say come to a conclusion on tax reform, which at least corporate tax reform is certainly, is certainly on the table. Certainly I think both sides have some ideas related to corporate tax reform that where they could forge an agreement. I don't think they have much common ground on, on individual uh, tax reform. But if you take, a, take an issue like that and you say, who are winners in this? If Republicans sit down with the president, Republicans in Congress and the president, they typically are the winners. And the losers are those people who are outside the deal. And so those are the dynamics of deal making you know, in the last two years coming up on another election. Jan, different view? Yeah, a little bit different. Not all that different, but a little bit different. My, 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 my global theory on this is, is that you, you get punished for doing the wrong thing. You don't get rewarded for doing the right thing. Okay, so you, you're a Republican in Congress. You negotiate with the White House. You get something done, like, you know, um, um, uh, bank, bank reform um, or um, trade or something like that. Um, <clears throat> you, you're not going to be rewarded for that. There's no um, uh, re-election um, that will be based on that. Um, you only get punished for doing the wrong thing. Um, but I, I do think that there is a pervasive anger at Washington that has been underreported and underestimated that, that just pervades these elections. Um, there were a lot of anti-Washington sentiment um, that uh, would have made life more difficult for, for uh, any incumbent, um, it, but for redistricting and but for a bunch of very astute um, people running for re-election. I mean, we're, we, we didn't get blindsided by this. By, nobody did. Um, but their lives would be better if that tapered just a little bit. Um, where I see the problem with um, most of these is um, the kind of the polarization of our elected representatives. If you go to banking regulation and you get rid of the consumer finance um, office, um, the left is going to go and open revolt. If you do immigration reform and there's anything closely, remotely resembling um, amnesty, uh, the right goes in revolt. If you do tax reform and there's not new money on the table, the left goes in, in revolt. If you do tax reform and it's not revenue neutral or a tax cut, the right goes in revolt. And all of this in an environment where the presidential primaries, particularly on our side, are just down the road, um, I think there will be a, a lot of sound and fury and a lot of noise. Um, and um, while all these things are things that need doing, um, a, a lot of uh, members don't like to do things that are difficult <laughs> or like to take risks. So I'm. I'm I, they, they all need doing, um, but the safe thing is to do fewer of them rather than to do more of them. And I think in the end, that's what happens. Uh, we'll be lucky if we get two done between now and October. 
Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I wanted to make a, a comment about our elections versus our governing, because I think, I think Jan is, is, is right about a lot of the dynamics, and he, he's right about the increased polarization that you see in government itself that is leading to a greater difficulty of sitting down and making an agreement. Remember, agreements never make everybody happy. They always, they take, you know, the best agreements take the best ideas from both sides, and they make some people happy about some, they make everybody happy about something, and nobody happy about everything, right? That's the best agreement. But we're having trouble getting there, and we're having trouble governing. So part of what I see coming out of the elections is I see two kinds of elections being run now. One is what I call a swing election. In a swing election, typically, the message reaches out to independents, soft members of the other, of the other party, and try to bring them around kind of a way forward that tackles some of the big issues and tries to exude some middle ground or compromise on some of them, takes some very strong positions on others, but he's clearly about reaching out and unifying the country. Building a bridge to the 21st century is a unifying message. Then I see, and I, and I think Obama's first election was a unifying message built around hope and change. Then I see other elections that are built on, that, that are built on bringing out the base. And if only we could increase turnout among the base, if only we can increase polarization, we can win. And I think Bush's re-election was a good example of that. And I think Obama's re-election was a good example of bringing out very strong turnout of the base and focusing incredibly well on this election strategy. The problem is the day after a base election, the public attitudes towards the presidency and towards what we should do are exactly the same as they were the day before, divided. After a swing election, the country is united around the result. At least 20, 25 percent of the country join the other side and say, hey, we're now together. And so you'll see the, the ratings of a president elected that way soar, and he'll have an opportunity not just to win an election, but a better opportunity to govern. That's why I think encouraging more elections that during the process of the election themselves, our swing elections, will result in better governing. And I think the two are, are quite intimately related. With that hopeful note, let's take it open to questions to the audience. Who has the first question for us? I have plenty more. I could go on all day. But uh, we have a question over here. Oh, well, we're waiting for that question, economics. If you think about uh, this election, a lot of people are complaining that the economy is better than the perception of the economy. If you look at the raw statistics versus what people feel about it. Well, we're, uh, we'll have our question in just a second, Greg, but what's, what's our view as to why is there that disconnect? Jan? Well, well three. Well, one is the, the statistics don't measure the misery. I mean, there are a lot of people who are um, not looking for work, and therefore they're not in the unemployment statistics. If you add the number of people who are looking for work and the people, number of people who have taken themselves out of the workforce, um, the, the numbers are, are much higher. They're, they're in the teens rather than in, in the five point something range. Um, the second thing is, there, there is th this has been a very, very slow recovery. Um, it, it's taken forever to get here. This has been five years under construction where previous recoveries are much quicker and much more noticeable. Um, in, in the third place, we, we have a real problem with income distribution. The, the two lowest quintiles really are, have gone back. I mean, they're making less, uh, prices are higher, um, and they're making, after inflation, they're making less than they made 15 years ago. So if they look at higher employment, um, the, the unemployment statistic really misses that point. Um, so I, I think there are just a variety of reasons why, why we're in a different economic situation than we have in previous economic situations where you had very rapid recoveries with very rapid income growth and, and, and growth in employment um, that you had um, after, um, in, in eight, that we had in 84, that we had in the mid-90s. Um, uh, it's a very different uh, economy that feels very differently now. So um, I think um, that, that's probably why Yes, the statistics say um, it is good, but it doesn't feel good. <clears throat> well, uh, look, I, I, think, 
I think part of it is in the political environment, uh, the Republicans say the economy is bad, and I think the administration, to be sensitive to the fact that the, the economy has problems like wage stagnation and income inequality, they also say, by and large, that the economy is bad. So why should anyone believe that the economy isn't bad? The entire political leadership, I think, is fairly united on that point, and the polls come out about 67% say that. Interestingly, when I worked with President Clinton, we had a very similar situation. Pat Buchanan said that the economy was bad, and we challenged the assumption, something Obama hasn't done. Because if you look at overall statistics, unemployment is down to you know, below, below 6%, below what the Fed target was, uh, <clears throat> below Fed targets, inflation is low, primary middle class costs of housing and gasoline uh, are down, corporate profits are up, Christmas sales are up. You, you have problems in the economy that Jan described, but you don't have the kind of across-the-board problems that we certainly had in 2009 after the financial crisis. You certainly don't have the kind of problems that are in sync with the massive discontent you see about, about the economy. So, so I think <clears throat> that's, you know, that's an issue. I always found that attitudes towards the economy that you really, it'd be very hard for you to tell whether you had five friends out of work or seven friends out of work, and yet that's the difference between a recession and, uh, and growth and full, and full employment. Uh, unless you have 10 or 15 friends out of work, uh, then I think you see that obviously. So a lot of it is colored by partisanship, uh, by, what's, uh, by the common, what I think now is a, an almost continual spinning down of the country uh, and the institutions. So I'd say yes, there are definitely economic problems. But there are a lot of good numbers here, and I, I'm just curious about the, we're in now a decade of what I call American pessimism. A, a child growing up in America has not <clears throat> known a time in which a majority of the public thinks the country is going in the right direction for over a decade. And that's a change from typical American optimism and can do. So speaking of American optimism and can do, Greg. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I hope this is an optimistic question. You know, I'm a boomer and I'm closer to Medicare than I am to my first election, but uh, I, I noticed that the millennials uh, uh, are sounding a little bit libertarian to me in some respects. And mostly what I'd like to know is where do the younger voter blocks fit into 2016 and beyond? And more importantly, are there, what do you think of the various blocks and their emerging importance in 2016? You want to take that first? Well, I, I, think, I think that the whole, if you look even in the exit polls, <coughs> and it looks at the exit polls here in 2014, depends how you define libertarianism, but you, you certainly see a significant shift in social attitudes. Uh, I think legalization of marijuana, even among the, the national exit poll, was, was within, within two points across the country. The, the percentage of people that thought that that abortion should be uh, severely restricted, which was less than a quarter. Uh, I, I think that you're really seeing on the social issues uh, a dramatic shift, I think, towards a, a viewpoint that, uh, of personal freedom on issue after issue. Uh, I think that, that attitudes towards the economy, towards the economic system, I think they're, they're quite different. I think you're, you're not seeing you're, you're not seeing attitudes saying that the balanced budget isn't, isn't important. And I think that, that when you ask about different uh, voting blocks, you know, the country, it's, it's quite interesting. I always say that if you were uh, a Martian and you came down to visit the country and you turned on the TV here, you would assume that every American was about age 25. Uh, and the truth is the whole reason that we're about to possibly have a social security crisis is that the country has never been older. We have never had an older age structure in the country. And I think that our voting will increasingly reflect older people, uh, women, uh, we're actually men, uh, we're 49%, usually men are really down to about 48% of the electorate. Uh, you've seen a dramatic increase in the Latino vote, which is gonna play uh, an increasing role. I think you've seen the African American vote go from 10 to 13%. But back in 1990, Back in 1996, uh, the Latino vote was 2%, and you're looking at kind of 8 or 
you know, of the electorate. So you're, you're looking at a fundamentally more diverse electorate. You're looking at a fundamentally uh, more educated electorate. Only 5% will not uh, have a high school degree. You're looking at a, uh, <clears throat> at a fundamentally more urban and suburban electorate. You, we've had a significant depopulation of the rural areas. Uh, so we are, we are looking at considerable demographic change in the country, I think that's, that's going to be reflected in, in, and is reflected in, in the political results. Having said that, a good administration that performs uh, is a good message. And a bad administration uh, that doesn't perform is still going to be you know, voted out at the end of the day, no matter what the demographics are. So in the end, are the youth in play for Republicans in 2016? The, the, the younger people who voted in the, these elections voted significantly more Republican. They, they didn't vote majority Republican, but significantly more Republican than they did in the both Obama elections. So um, in the under 30 vote, um, the uh, support for Obama was in the 60s. Um, in, in the high 60s, close to 70, uh, it, just now the under 30 vote I think was 44% Republican, if I'm doing this correctly from memory. Um, the significant fact was that far fewer of them turned out. Um, as far as the uh, libertarians are concerned, um, a very interesting phenomenon there. There are a couple of elections that I was very closely involved in um, where at one point the libertarian candidate was getting seven, eight, nine percent of the vote. I'm talking about Scott Howe in North Carolina and um, Patterson in Kentucky. They were getting nine percent of the vote. And if you looked at what they were, it was a, a, a pox on both their houses vote. Um, it was a none of the above vote. It had nothing to do with libertarianism. It was heavily concentrated among younger voters, specifically younger males. Um, and in the end, they didn't show. Um, they got 3% of the vote, I think, in both cases. And the premise is th they both suck. It's not a good premise for turnout. Um, so I, I, as, 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 as long as that is the basis of a third party libertarian voting, um, I, don't think, um, I don't think there's a lot of change that takes place there. Uh, with regard to younger voters, is the thing about them is they grow older, and they buy homes, they get kids, and there's this whole change process that takes place, and all of a sudden they become a little bit more conservative um, in, in the course of their, their voyage through the 30s and the 40s. Um, the, the interesting group to watch is the Hispanic, because that really is a group that's growing very rapidly. Um, I live in Harris County. I think 10 years from now I'll be... Um, the, it, it's now a majority minority county. Um, Ten years from now, I think I'll be the second uh, m minority. The largest minority will be Hispanics. Um, and what's going on there is, is that Hispanics register at a much lower rate than um, either African Americans or white do. If you look at registration rates, African Americans and whites register at roughly the same rate. It's roughly around 72% or something like that. Um, Hispanics only register at a roughly 49% rate. And once they're registered, um, they also vote at much lower rates. Um, African Americans and whites will vote at largely the same rate. I think in the 12 Obama election, blacks actually voted a little bit more than whites did. Um, but Hispanics are still um, uh, dragging. They're still not voting at the same rate. So if turnout rates in a presidential election among whites and blacks is around 70, 69, 70 percent, among Hispanics it's still around 50 percent. So I now have, have used a 50 percent word twice, right? So 50% registers 50% of the 50% votes. Vote. That means that only a quarter of the Hispanics actually participate. Um, that is a sleeping giant. Um, and at some point, that sleeping giant is going to wake up. Nope, none of us know when. Uh, but at some point, it'll wake up, and it'll be a major force in this country. Um, there is one episode in California in the, um, under Wilson when Wilson did his anti-immigrant and walls along the border campaign, I think it was in 94, his 94 re-election campaign, um, Hispanic participation before and after went from 8% to 15%. It's now closer to 20%, but it's grown very slowly. But all of a sudden, this sleeping giant woke up um, and started part participating and continued to participate in all California elections afterwards. That simply hasn't happened in other states, but it will. So I think the, the more interesting group to watch of all of them is the Hispanic vote. And at some point, it'll wake up, it'll show up, and um, it'll be a new force in, uh, in politics. I, I, I agree with that. And the only thing I'd add is, though, that a lot of the differential 
that you see in the youth vote in the midterms has to do with the lower African American and Latino turnout that would have been younger. And so that mix would have been different. And I think that accounts for the, the better showing of the Republican Party with young people, as opposed to actually a, a, a shift. We could go on all day, but to keep this on time, we'll take our last question over here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, so the question becomes, what does? You're okay. You're okay. I'm curious what does work. If we're in this decade of American pessimism based on the other guy sucks, and that runs election by election, given the diverse electorate, given the diverse demographics, what is the message or who does the messenger need to be that can create that unifying message that allows for more of a renewal of that American optimism versus just this polarized American pessimism? I think it's, it's gonna have to be somebody showing a new face. Um, now, I'll do it from the Republican side. Um, what would be new? A Republican who actually talked about education and actually fixed it? I mean, we're scared to talk about education because we think that talking about education means spending more money. Um, I think there are ways to improve our schools without spending more money. So I've been advocating for a Republican position on education that is a reform position um, that might actually have a consequence. Um, I think there are other areas of public policy where Republicans are simply afraid to go. Um, healthcare is another one. Um, and so if, if, if one of the parties showed a completely new face um, and talked about issues that people deeply care about, the voters care deeply about education at the state level more than the federal level, but they care deeply about it, and only one party talks about it. If the other party uh, had something new and interesting and creative to say about it, and, and heaven forbid it might actually work, um, I think something like that would... Um, uh, present a new face and change the equation of choices that we've been dealing with here for the last 20 years or so. I mean, look, uh, uh, I might have my personal favorites uh, in the upcoming race, but I, I, I think that, that whoever is the next president has got to carry a, a message that in the 21st century that's driven by technology, innovation, globalization, and change, America can find a successful place. That there has to be a confidence in our ability to educate, to innovate, to get out of the way for business, to create stability, to create you know, higher wages, to create uh, you know, budgets that make sense, to simplify a tax system, to fix an immigration problem that's been sitting there. Americans see big problems. They want to see wages move with jobs. They want to see Social Security and Medicare crisis averted. They want to see you know, budgets come closer to balance. They want to see energy sufficiency you know, created in the country. And they want to see, just as America dreamed that they could go to the moon, they want to see a president who is not just going to talk about them going up to the election, but is going to get them done. You know, and before this period of pessimism, we had a tremendous period of optimism coming out of the Clinton administration and coming into the beginning of the, of the 21st century. And they're looking, I think, for us to <clears throat> lead as the indispensable nation across the globe. I think that's a critical component. And they won't get there without leadership. They think that they don't want to return to putting troops in, in every place as a solution. But, but in order, but still have a strong presence in moderating and affecting the big forces that are, that are, that are happening in the globe. So the next presidential race, I think, is, is not going to be about things that are small, but about these very big fundamental issues. And I think it is going to be, going to be a big and, and important race, given where the country is today and I think, I think <coughs> well, where the American people are. Well, we here in Minnesota are a place where few are called, but many are frozen. <laughs> and uh, since our two guests came from sunny uh, Houston and uh, D.C. during this time of snow, we want to welcome you as part of the frozen chosen. So uh, thanks. So let's give our guests one more round of applause. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Mark. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. 
the Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.